Were there any right on the tip of your tongue or you want to listen for a bit? Yeah, Eve, go ahead. Okay, as a lake practitioner, if I wanted to perform some a sadhana like this, um, would I memorize and learn the Tibetan? Would I listen to an audio? And how often might I do something like this? Well, uh, what, what do you mean by a lay practitioner? <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, um, take vows or, or, you know, I just want to have a good practice at home um, with just by myself. So you mean, um, are you talking about monastic versus lay or are you talking about Buddhist versus non-Buddhist? No, uh, monastic versus lay. Right, right. So in terms of Tantra, um, there's not a difference in the practice between lay people and monastics, generally speaking. Um, it's more a question of what suits your own mind in terms of how deeply you want to get into these practices. So if you were to take the empowerment from a Lama, there might be a daily practice commitment. There would definitely be Bodhisattva vows. If you don't feel ready to take an empowerment um, of Kriya Tantra, this lower Tantra version, um, but you still love the practice and are happy to continue visualizing deity at the crown of your head and the deity in front, but know that you don't yet have permission to see yourself as the deity, then it's just completely a matter of personal choice how often you were to do the practice, but it still would be a beautiful daily practice if you wanted to use it in that way. In terms of the Tibetan, don't feel like you need to learn Tibetan or learn the Tibetan chanting if it doesn't sit comfortably. One of the benefits is um, these practices were done for hundreds of years by Tibetan people in Tibetan language. And so by speaking the words in the way that our teachers spoke them, there's an energetic connection and a karmic connection that can kind of help lift you. A lot of the tunes, were from Dakinis themselves, which really help move the mind towards enlightenment more swiftly and kind of engage blessings. But it's fine to do in English as well. And that, you know, the practice is powerful. It's a powerful practice in any language that you do it. So our tradition, it's very common to kind of alternate one verse Tibetan, one verse English. Some days do it all in Tibetan, some days do it all in English. It's really a matter of preference. But the reasons why we use Tibetan are those that I mentioned. Does that answer your question or, or were you thinking of a different angle? Uh, no, that answers my question. And maybe in a few years, I would have a different answer, you know, so I, I know where to start. That's sure. Good... Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, Joanne? Good morning. Thank you for the teaching. Um, I'm curious, last night you had mentioned that you can use any image for the deity yoga. So I, I go towards green Tara, but mm -hmm. today I'm curious why you picked the forearm white Shendrezig. I like him. Oh. <laughs> okay. So it's not specific. So, um, uh, there, there are deeper reasons. Um, there, one of the reasons is that this sadhana um, explicitly mentions developing the self-generation via the six deities. And all forms of Korean Tantra imply this process, but don't necessarily explicitly signpost it. And so it's a very clear sadhana. It's a very um, specific and direct sadhana. And it's one that will come up a lot in a lot of different forms, especially if you do Nungne practice, um, which is the fasting retreat that's very popular in our tradition. Another benefit to Chenrezig is that we are lucky enough to see Chenrezig in human form as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So there's a stronger, closer connection with that deity, which means sometimes progress can go more swiftly because there's kind of that current karmic connection okay. in the world today but you. um you know tara and chenrezig are equal in ability and equal in power and if you have more affinity for tara do tara what we wind up doing is it's almost like having a tool belt and you get some acquaintance and some familiarity with all of the main deities and then you turn to them for particular things that you feel you need a boost with your practice 
and then some of them you do daily because they're like your heart connection and the others are kind of miscellaneous tools that you use for specific times okay thank you yeah you're welcome you're welcome um okay anybody else so far so good or it's like it's too different to even have the question clear yet and you just kind of need to let it brew okay well let's yeah go ahead join yeah well i do have one just in terms of the tibetan language and when you went through the om ah um and crown third and then at the heart also is hri h r i h is there a translation for that word um, it's the seed syllable. So mm -hmm. it's instead of a like a word to word translation, there's more a description of it embodying the essence of Chen Rezig, which is compassion and wisdom. Okay. So all deities are going to have like a seed syllable, like for Tara, it would be Tam. And it's kind of the essence of that deity. And it also becomes the simplest form of the concentration meditation. So, you know, you can have elaborate forearm Chen Rezig all this, you know, all of the aspects, but if you need to concentrate your mind very simply, you just zero it in just on the free. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And if the Tibetan characters or the Tibetan script is hard for you to get your head around, it's okay to imagine those sounds in English characters. So the sound is more important than the script. So if a Tibetan om doesn't pop into your mind easily, but om does, it's fine to do that. It's about the sound. And so the symbols are to represent that sound. Yeah, other thoughts? Okay, we'll jump in if you remember um, stuff you've been meaning to ask, but I'll just um, start at the beginning. So this particular um, form of the sadhana is meant specifically for retreat. So even though we're not doing a three week Chen Rezig retreat or a one month Chen Rezig retreat, we're doing a little mini day retreat. So we're doing this slightly longer version of the sadhana so that you get to know more parts about Tantra. Um, and this particular one was composed by Geshe Wangchen um, in New Zealand. And the English was um, taken from parts of the Nungne Sadhana, and all errors are mine. <laughs> um, so on this first page, we have just a line drawing of Chen Rezig, because sometimes that helps us visualize more details. So his four arms represent the four immeasurable thoughts, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So forearm Chen Rezig is really beautiful. There's of course thousand arm Chen Rezig and two arm Chen Rezig and various forms of Chen Rezig, um, some to, for pain and illness, some for increasing wisdom, all sorts of nuances of Chen Rezig. But this particular form um, I think is quite common and accessible. Generally speaking, the Lotus is gonna represent the wisdom realizing emptiness. The lotus that he sits on is going to represent renunciation. And all deities are sitting on a lotus or standing on a lotus. And the one that they're sitting or standing on always represents renunciation, the determination to be free. And then you're going to have a little tiny sliver of a sun disk and on top of that a moon disk. For some deities, it's a sliver of a moon disc, and on top of that is a sun disc. Um, sometimes you can't see the little sliver underneath, but what these represent is the sun is the wisdom realizing emptiness, the moon is bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. And so the point of these three is that Tantra is always based on the three principal aspects of the path, renunciation, correct view, bodhicitta. And the one that they're closest sitting on is the one they're emphasizing. So because he's sitting on a moon disc, the emphasis is on bodhicitta. So this is something that you're gonna see again and again, and it's um, true across the board. The rest of the symbolism is sometimes dependent on the deity themselves. Um, this wish fulfilling jewel is representing compassion. 
And the reason a jewel represents compassion is because compassion is one of the most precious things in the world. Jewels are precious, compassion is precious, easy peasy metaphor there. The mala or the, the prayer beads is to indicate that you should recite the mantra. <laughs> so simple like that. Okay, so those are just kind of the basic pieces of Chenrezig. Um, there's a lot of beautiful commentaries to get into every tiny detail. Um, if you ever take a class from a Tonka painter, sometimes they have really excellent understanding of all the symbolism, but it's kind of like a mind map for anchoring your scholastic intellectual knowledge of Dharma into imagery and iconography so that you can hold it in mind in the essence form without having to analytically go through the process of, okay, wisdom, okay, compassion. It's like, you've already studied wisdom and compassion. Now you're just plugging it into this form with less analysis or no analysis. And you're just thinking of the embodiment of those. So slowly, slowly. And then we have these offerings. And these are the offerings on the altar. I just have plain water today, but if we were doing a full retreat, we would do these two sets. And this is again, something you'll see in all Kriya Tantra, lower Tantra practices. You'll see a front generation offering and a self generation offering. The front generation is to the deity in front. The self generation is to yourself as the deity for those of you that have the empowerment. If you don't have the empowerment, you can just think both sets are going to the space in front, or one is going to the Buddha at your crown and one is going to the Buddha in front of you. But that's why they're going two different directions, because you've got agyam, padyam, pupe, dupe, aloke, gande, new day, water for drinking, water for washing, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, um, food, and then music is represented by chanting or the bell, sometimes by a conch, but usually it's left unrepresented physically. And then you have those exact same ones going the other direction because that you're, you're offering from that direction or you're taking from that direction. So water for, wa water for drinking, water for washing, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food. And then we have the five sense enjoyments. Um, so this little guitar is pleasant sound. Yeah, he's down there. Um, this mirror is pleasant form. These little scarves are pleasant touch. There's little um, conch with perfume in it for pleasant smells. And there's some food stuck in amongst there for um, pleasant tastes. Did I miss any? I think that's all five. So basically, these are the things that normally trigger distraction, that normally trigger attachment. And what we're saying is we can still make use of these things, but if we offer them up together with the bliss that they stimulate, we can keep the bliss and lose the attachment because we're remembering that they're empty and we're offering to what we respect. So it's an interesting psychology to play with, but you also do a lot of offerings in Tantra in order to accumulate the merit for the rest of the practice. Yeah, when you get to the mantra recitation time and the visualization and the mantra recitation, that's kind of the heart of everything coming together. And to have the concentration and focus for that to go deeply, you need a lot of merit. So a lot of the front end of the practice is to accumulate this mental momentum so that when you finally get to the more concentrated part of the practice, it comes more easily. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche um, has written a commentary on um, the Chenrezig practice. It's called Teachings from the Mani Retreat. And Teachings from the Mani Retreat is a free publication from Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive, and um, I really recommend it. And I'll give you a book list at the end of the retreat, so if you don't remember, no worries. But he says this about the benefits of offerings. He says, offering water makes the mental continuum calm and clear. And you can feel this right after offering water. I've noticed that right after offering water, you feel an effect your mind feels somehow clear and peaceful. 
I'm sure that those of you who have been doing many water offerings have much experience of this. Offering water brings calm, clear mind and increases qualities or realizations within your mental continuum. This is just a brief explanation of the very essence of the benefit. I'm not going into a much more extensive explanation of the benefits that is given in the sutra teachings. Offering light increases wisdom, not just general wisdom, but Dharma wisdom. This is not the kind of wisdom that knows how many people in Australia have short hair and how many have long hair. It means Dharma wisdom that knows what is right to be practiced and is what is wrong and to be abandoned. Dharma wisdom helps us achieve happiness, especially liberation from samsara, from all suffering in its causes and full enlightenment. With Dharma wisdom, we are able to realize the Four Noble Truths and thus achieve liberation from samsara. So offering light develops Dharma wisdom. Offering light increases your Dharma wisdom and brings you five types of clairvoyance. It also helps prolong your life. And offering light to other sentient beings or illuminating an altar where there are holy objects instead of leaving it in darkness brings the karma while you are in samsara to never be born in a dark age when no Buddha has descended and there are no teachings in the world. You are born only in an age of light when a Buddha has descended and the Dharma exists in the world. You were born where Dharma exists and then you meet the Dharma, both. So um, I haven't put the whole section about light here. Lama Zopa Rinpoche goes into a lot of detail about how important it is to offer light. Um, if candles are too dangerous for you to offer, little lamps, I don't know if you can see my little lamp, you can see the light of my little lamp anyway. Um, having a lamp on your altar is a really good idea. Um, little, little tiny lights, you can get them at Ikea, I don't know, lots of places. Um, but I think that uh, offering light is kind of like something that we can do quite easily, just flip a switch, but it has such a benefit to the mind. Even just immediately, it kind of uplifts the mind to have light on the altar. And then if you can add more, that's excellent. Um, offering incense has many general benefits, as I mentioned before, but it has the particular benefit of causing you to achieve a beautiful body. Also, even while you are in samsara, you will enjoy scented smells all the time, and you will be able to live in, your, in pure morality, which is, of course, the most important. The general benefits are the same for each offering, and then each offering has its own particular benefits. By offering flowers, you become a leader of others, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other holy beings, who receive highest respect from other sentient beings. In that way, you are then able to benefit others more. Because others respect you, they listen to you and follow you. If you give teachings, they will listen to and then follow what you say. And that is how you bring them from happiness to happiness to enlightenment. Also, the result of offering flowers is that your conduct becomes pure. Offering medicine during the practice, as I mentioned the other day, helps you to not experience sickness while you are in samsara. So this is something I do with um, my vitamins a lot. Sometimes I put them on the altar and I offer medicine. Um, by offering food, the grains, for example, while you are in samsara, you don't experience famine. You are always able to find food and the food is plentiful and healthy. You can always receive and enjoy crops, fruit, honey, milk, and so forth and the food you eat makes you healthy instead of harming your body. So even if it's just like a little apple on the altar each day, that's something lovely you can do. By offering divine dress to the merit field, whether um, mentally visualized or like a piece of cloth or a kata that you offer, you're able to live in pure morality. It also causes you to receive a Vajra holy body. Offering divine dress to Compassion Buddha causes you to achieve the Vajra holy body of Compassion Buddha. By offering ornaments. So um, during the practice offering ornaments, you can just offer the mala in your hand, um, or you might have like a fancier one that you use just for that purpose. Um, you create the karma to have great enjoyments and you achieve the holy signs and exemplifications of the holy body of the Buddha. 
offering a vase, which doesn't come up in this particular practice, but comes up in the Nungne practice, purifies your negative karmas and delusions and helps you to generate loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta in your heart. So let's see, the vase that they're talking about is like one of these. Yeah, so they don't mean like a flower vase, they mean um, a vase that you use in ritual settings like this. So the merit of every single offering to Buddha is inconceivable. Just by offering one tiny stick of incense or one flower to a statue, painting or scripture of Buddha, or by thinking of Buddha has inconceivable merit. So that is the advertisement for the day of do lots of offerings. Yes, <laughs> do lots of offerings. Do the Buddhas need your offerings? No, they don't. Do the Buddhas um, seek application and do they seek gift giving and do they need you to um i don't know shower them with abundance no they don't care this is not for the buddha's sake this is for your sake because we become receptive to what we respect yeah we become receptive to what we respect we also place value where we've given value yeah so if you are um, paying for something, you often engage with it more deeply than if it's free. You know that kind of psychology? Similarly, if you're putting you know, resource energy into something, you're more likely to engage more deeply with it. Yeah, you've put in the energy. Then there's the added benefit too of just kind of continuously being in contact with holy images reinforces your habituation with them and makes you have a stronger karmic connection with them. And these images are not accidental and they aren't like purely art, right? These came from the holy mind of enlightened beings. And so they have power from their side, not inherently from their side, but from their side by dependent arising of the beings who created them. So there's a lot of benefits to doing offerings, but it's a psychology, right? It's not like I will give them this and they will give me that, or um, they are gonna strike me down with lightning if I don't change my water bowls on time. Like, don't get weird, yeah? Don't bring in like miscellaneous mystical stuff from Greek mythology or some sort of other religion that you used to practice or some sort of, you know, like, meet it cleanly. No one is watching <laughs> except for you and the Buddhas. Yeah. So the main thing is that the, the offerings that you offer are ethically obtained, you know, so don't go picking your neighbor's flowers and putting them on your altar, right? Only pick your own flowers or buy them yourself, right? Stuff like that. Common sense. Yeah, common sense. The, the seven offerings also represent the seven limbs in the seven limb prayer. They also represent mental qualities that you'd like to offer. What is the best thing you can offer your teachers and the Buddhas? Practice, right? Practice, practicing the Dharma is what they want you to do. Why? So you stop suffering and hurting yourself and others, right? So water for drinking can represent just merit. Water for washing, purification. Flowers, the open heart of compassion. Yeah. So then incense, the practice of ethics, of non-harmfulness. Light, wisdom, as Rinpoche mentioned. Perfume, faith. Yeah, but faith based in reason, conviction, experience, not passive faith or blind faith. Yeah. Food, the food of samadhi or the food of concentration. And then music, like for harmonious communities. So these are practices that are not tangible per se, but can be represented by tangible objects. So by offering them, you're engaging with those mentalities. By seeing them, you're reminded to do them, et cetera, et cetera. So like with all things in Buddhism, there are many layers. Why those particular 
pretty things on the altar. Why water? Why flowers? Those were the traditional things that you'd offer an important person coming to your house in ancient India and Nepal. Right? If somebody fancy was coming to your house, you'd give them a drink of water when they arrived, you'd wash their feet, you'd give them flower garlands, right? You'd be waving incense in front of them because it probably smelled like a toilet, right? There'd be pretty lights to offer around. You'd give some incense to their heart and give them a beautiful meal and music, right? Those are the beautiful things that you'd offer someone important coming to your house. Who is more important than the Buddhas coming to your house? Yeah. So layers and layers, right? Layers and layers. Offering thoughts, offering questions. Yeah, slowly, slowly. I have a question. Sure. So with all of the traditional offerings that we would normally put in our altar, if we're talking about our altar at home where we do our practice, can we add to that altar and put things that make sense to us today that are a little bit more modern? So if we start to think about, well, what, what would I like to offer the Buddhas? If it's not on the traditional list, what about offering other things? Can we add to our own personal altar? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, the traditional stuff like water, you know, water is a really, really good one um, because water is both precious, you know, it's incredibly precious. We'll always agree that it's precious. All human beings throughout time and space will agree water is a really important thing and it's easily accessible. So offering water is something that can get your mind into the mental training of making offerings easily because you're not gonna feel the tug of miserliness and fear of deprivation, but you also value it and it's important. Oh, so, you can, so you can build that habituation quite easily. And so for most of us, water is a default we're always doing every day. Candles are a default we're doing every day. Probably some food, um, like I have a little, what do I have? I have macadamia nuts today is what we have in a little jar. But you know, like the miscellaneous other things, you know, if you wanna offer, something else that's ethically obtained if it makes your mind uplifted to offer it it's a good offering okay that's what i was wondering yeah. if it makes Thanks. your mind uplifted then it's a good offering i wanted to thank you for one particular point you made which is that um you mentioned something like things that normally trigger attachment all of these things mm -hmm. um when offered up actually help us to work with the I guess, um, affliction of attachment, which is a completely new insight to me um, and was has been for decades now of practice, I have to admit, um, maybe one of my biggest stumbling blocks, the, the thingness, the, mm. uh, the ornamentation yeah. uh, um, of, of this practice of Buddhism. Um, so it's really helpful to me. And if you want to say anything more about how we can um, focus our minds upon this particular goal of, of freeing ourselves from attachment or renunciation mm. by vis-a-vis -vis giving the um, get, uh, offering to, yeah. to prostrating to these qualities in our mind. But by using desire, I started to read Lama Yeshi's introduction to Tantra last night, but, you know, using the subtle, I guess, uh, mechanism of desire to get to this, you know, freedom from it. Yeah. The altar seems like an interesting um, vehicle for that, but that I haven't really quite understood until this moment. So I want to thank you at, at the very least. Oh, good. Yeah, no, I'm glad. And it's, it's important to be able to engage on a lot of levels to keep there being a lot of energy with it. But I think that part of the offering practice is remembering the emptiness of inherent existence, that these pleasurable objects aren't pleasurable from their own side. Like if you, you know, you say your favorite thing is chocolate, but if you're depressed, it doesn't taste like anything, right? But you still might binge on it, hoping for the happiness it once gave you on a good day, you know? And you're just like chasing the happiness and you think, well, maybe if I eat more, it'll, it'll come, you know? Forgetting that you actually can stimulate the pleasure of eating chocolate 
if you really used your imagination in this moment and there was no chocolate in front of you? Couldn't you, right? So if it was giving you happiness from its own side, it could only give you happiness when you took it and put it in your gob, right? <laughs> but like sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> right? But by visualizing it and thinking about the pleasure of it, you can stimulate that same satisfaction. Yeah, and then of course, probably craving as well. And you're like, well, now I want chocolate. Thanks, Yintin. I really want chocolate now. But you know, like you can really think about this is a level of desire that maybe we can use the level of desire of romantic relationships we're going to have to work up to to be able to use it without going nuts to be able to use it without it being a catalyst for obsession or craving but you know thinking about something like chocolate where the pleasure of it the temptation of it the bliss of it all of that can happen from just your imagination yeah. And then you realize maybe it always has, <laughs> right? When you've eaten it and it has given you pleasure, it was a condition, not the substantial cause. Yeah. If it was the substantial cause, there'd be a whole different set of things going on and there would be consistency. Yeah. And the exact same chocolate would give the exact same amount of happiness every single time, no matter how much or when. Yeah, so in terms of offerings, you know, it's, it's important to look at things like have you guys been to Guru Puja Tsog at a Dharma center where they offer really abundant things on the altar like tons of chocolate, tons of flowers, you know, tons of like junk food like chips and stuff. And you think, these are Buddhists, like, aren't they all kind of like vegan-ish people or at least vegetarians? And like, shouldn't there be like a veggie casserole or something? Why is there potato chips when none of us even eat potato chips in our regular life? Why is that? What? And it's on purpose, right? It's not accidental that it's junk food. It's on purpose junk food because why? Junk food triggers massive attachment. You could put some kale there and think that looks delicious and healthy and I'd like that kale, but you're not like excited about it unless you're really into your health food, right? But like, can you have one potato chip and be like, and that's enough, then you put the bag down. No, you have one potato chip, even if you haven't been eating them since childhood and you're like, oh, fat and salt, fat and salt are happiness, give me more, right? And you're just like, rum, rum, rum. cookie monster, yeah. So we use foods that trigger attachment for tantric practice on purpose. They have to be things that generate attachment. Otherwise, the practice doesn't work. How can you transform this energy and release the craving while keeping the bliss unless there's something to provoke the bliss? So theoretically, it can all be in the realm of imagination. But practically speaking, we need some sort of anchor that habitually we have that relationship to, yeah? So we're not gonna put a bunch of, I don't know, exotic supermodels on the altar to trigger attachment. That would be weird. And, but, you know, it could be like that, but we're just not ready for that yet. Yeah. So use chocolate, so use potato chips, yeah. And the thing is, is that it's almost like the bliss of delayed gratification because you're putting all of these things you want on the altar and you can't have them until halfway through the puja and then you get them back. So it's like in offering them, you're releasing your attachment to them and you're saying, okay, this is all for the Buddhas, all for the Buddhas, all for the Buddhas. And you like make peace with not getting it. <laughs> That's for the Buddhas and I'm so happy because those are delicious. And then 45 minutes later, it falls into your lap and you're like, oh, yum. But, you know, maybe it's got a little less attachment because you've got that delayed gratification thing happening. Yeah, so there's a lot of things going on simultaneously at these pujas that are not just like, yay, chocolate. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, Eve, did you want to ask? Yeah, uh, you might have been heading in this direction, but as a housekeeping question for the altar offerings, um, do you like, uh, let's say I pour a bowl of water, 
do I just dump it down the drain when I'm tidying and then the next day or, uh, you know, a little bit of practical question here about what to do and what not to do. Well, because offerings are um, something that you're trying to see as precious, then you don't want to treat them in an ordinary way afterwards. So at the end of the day, these water bowls, I'm going to empty them into a container I use only for that purpose. I'm going to dry the bowls with a towel I use only for that purpose. And the water, I am not going to pour it down the drain. I'm going to use it in a way that respects what it was used for. So you can use it to water plants. You can drink it yourself. You can put it in the kettle. You can pour it outside, but don't pour it anywhere that you know people are going to be walking over and there's a lot of foot traffic. So, you know, pour it in the garden, not on the sidewalk like that. So basically with all used offerings, they should never be treated like garbage or rubbish. Yeah. So um, same goes with the food, same goes with the flowers. Like the flowers, once they're starting to lose vitality, don't put them in the garbage can, put them in the garden somewhere to gently compost where people are not going to be walking on them. You know what I mean? And don't put them like in the regular like yucky compost, like put them to just naturally disintegrate somewhere, you know, in the garden under a bush or something. So it's basically treat them with respect. Okay, so something like the macadamia nuts, for an example, you you would be eating them or serving them to pe the people you're feeding? Yeah, once, once they've done their job, once I've um, offered them up in the practice, then at the end of the day, I then I um, do a little mantra and I can write that down for you guys to take them off of the altar and then I can eat them or I can give them to someone. Um, but it's, uh, it's important that you leave it on the altar and genuinely offer it before taking it off again and using it, even if it's just a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, any other offering thoughts? Okay, so um, with the Tibetan, there's a section where we're blessing the offerings and then there's a section where we're offering the offerings. And there's a big title above those sections. When you're blessing the offerings, you can only actually bless offerings if you have the empowerment because you can't bless something as an ordinary being, but you can offer things as an ordinary being. So during that blessing section, if you don't have the, if you don't have the empowerment, you just think that the Buddha on your crown is doing it on your behalf. Yeah, so um, that's one piece. And basically the blessing process is to overcome your ordinary appearance and grasping at the offering objects. Yeah. So you think that uh, they are empty in nature, they arise in the aspect of this offering, say water or flowers, and their nature is to give uncontaminated bliss, meaning uncontaminated by attachment. All right. So we'll keep going. And we won't do the whole thing right now. We'll just do a few more sections and then we'll do the have a little break and do the practice. So Starting at the beginning, you do like a little short motivation just to yourself to make sure you're in the right headspace for it. And then you do the preliminary visualization. And this is a visualization which is same for everybody, empower, empowered or not empowered, which is on the crown, facing the same direction as you, you know, just a few feet high right there. Yeah. And so you think seated upon a white lotus and moon disc is, and implied is there is also a sun disc, but we're just gonna say moon disc, my root guru, Chen Rezik. So the important thing here is to think that the guru is one in nature with Chen Rezik. If you can see Chen Rezik above your crown and visualize clearly the details and aspects, that's excellent, that's good for developing your concentration. If you just see white light and it can't clarify itself into details yet because it's not familiar enough, that's okay too. But the most important thing is to think the guru, one in essence with the deity, is here. Yeah, in this form that I'm attempting to visualize. 
And the way we engage with that is that we first build it through visualization or imagination. And then we think about the three syllables, om, ah, hum, which represent enlightened body, enlightened speech, and enlightened mind. And enlightened body, speech, and mind are um, sometimes referred to as the three vajras. And these are repeated for all deities. So it's not just Chenrezig that has an om, ah, hum, it's all deities. And then the seed syllable, in this case, shri, goes just slightly in front of it. And I didn't add it in the picture because it would get too um, compli complicated. But right now, you just think white light comes from the om, red light comes from the ah, blue light comes from the hum, inviting the enlightened body, enlightened speech, and enlightened mind of all the Buddhas, of all 10 directions, who are in the form of Chenrezig, because of course every Buddha can become Chenrezig, right? Or become Tara, or become this, or become that. So all of the Buddhas take the form of Chenrezig and absorb into the Buddha at your crown. And this way you think, what I've imagined now is true. What I've imagined now is true. You with me so far? Yeah. And this will come up again in the invocation prayer, but it's not like he wasn't already there. <laughs> he was already there before you visualized him, before you invited him. All the Buddhas are, you know, pervading all of space and time. The mind of the Buddha pervades all, not to worry but we're clarifying and engaging a particular archetypal energy, compassionate wisdom. And we want to engage with that specifically, and we want to engage with it personally. So we need a representation of that, and we need kind of a relationship with it. And so thinking that the guru whether it's His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Zopa Rinpoche, or maybe you have many teachers and they all merge into this form together with every other enlightened being that has ever been. This is a way to really feel held and seen and engaged with this energy, which can feel a little bit amorphous or abstract. But if you're thinking of a human relationship or human beings qualities that you emulate, that you seek mentorship from, it becomes a deeper and more personal engagement for you. Yeah. So, you know, if His Holiness was in front of us, you know, laughing and speaking of world peace and interfaith harmony and the depths of wisdom and interconnection, we would have such a, you know, kind of a warm hearted feeling being with him, wouldn't we? Even if he just said hello to us, we'd have this warmth just being with him. And so you think about the warmth of being with him, even if it's just online, even if it's in you know, a crowd of thousands of people, but that amazing warmth that you feel with someone like his holiness. And you take that and you plug it in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're engaging with something real, not something just imagined. So yeah, that one's making sense so far. Yeah. So that's just beginning. You're just establishing here now. He's here now. He's here now. Um, what I've imagined is actually present. And then we continue on and do the actual taking refuge and generating bodhicitta. So up here, we just like took a moment, took a moment to ourselves in our own words to just get into the right headspace. Now we're getting a bit more specific. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha Dharma Supreme Assembly, Sangha. By accumulating merit through practicing generosity and so on, may I become a Buddha to benefit reincarnating beings. So it's just your classic refuge bodhicitta prayer. And then you add to it special bodhicitta, which is tantric bodhicitta, which is I will quickly, very quickly, attain the precious state of perfect and complete Buddhahood. And for this reason, I will specifically practice this yoga method of Chenrezig Compassion Buddha with one face and four arms. So I want to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. That goes without saying. You know, I've been doing this refuge in Bodhicitta for some time now. 
but now I want it to be quicker because sentient beings are suffering now. They need me now. So I'm going to up my game. Quickly, very quickly is the special part. And then four immeasurables, love, compassion, joy, equanimity, as represented by the four arms of Chenrezig. And then we purify the place, you know, establishing the scene, kind of getting the mind into this idea that everything, even our polluted, contaminated environment, even our messy house, even our whatever, whatever, also has a pure nature to it. And so we're engaging with that and imagining the purity of a pure realm. And from that place, we try to make pure offerings. So may human and divine offerings, those actually arranged, so those that are literally on your altar and on altars that you know exist in the world. You can also think of other people's altars and other temples altars. And then those mentally created, so you can think of, you know, some beautiful fireworks you saw one year or, you know, some beautiful flower arrangement you saw at the fair one time. Or, you know, you can mentally generate other beautiful things that you've seen. And then clouds of finest Samatabhadra offerings fill the entire space. So this Samatabhadra practice is this um, particular practice where you take what you visualized and then you multiply and multiply and multiply it. So your whole field of imagination is filled with offerings. So you take what you've, you know, kind of made somewhat concrete in your mind and then expand and expand. And you reinforce that with the offering cloud mantra, which is, may it be so, may the merit of all those offerings be actualized, just as if they were all literally here as multiplied as I visualized. So it's, it's this vast practice, this cloud offering mantra, and it takes a while to get your head around the, the offering cloud mantra, but it'll come up in lots and lots of texts. So it's good to try. Your pronunciation doesn't have to be perfect. My pronunciation is not perfect. It's sort of Sanskrit, Tibetan, English, you know, Montana, Yuntin weirdness, you know, so it's like not too bad, but not perfect. Yours is gonna be not too bad, but not perfect. You just do your best. The main thing is always intention. If you can get close to the Sanskrit pronunciation, that's good. But then if you've learned from your teacher and your teacher is Tibetan and they've got a Tibetan accent and they're saying Benza instead of Vajra, that's fine too. Yeah, so it's intention. And the main thing is to try and visualize these offerings multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and fueling your whole field of vision. Yeah, Ali. Hi, Venerable Yantin. Uh, can you hear me? I can, I can. Sweet. Um, good morning. I wanted to um, ask, I noticed that the 100, 100 syllable mantra is very similar to the Vajrasattva mantra. Um, I wanted to ask about that. Um, it's the same. The only difference is Padma instead of Vajra. Padma because this practice belongs to the Padma family, which is the Lotus family related to Amitabha. And um, you'll see this in tantric practices that the purification mantra is going to be basically the Vajrasattva purification mantra with one or two syllables changed to reflect the Buddha family that that practice belongs to. So um, do you guys know about five Buddha families or do you want a quick five Buddha families chat? I would have families chance. Yes, that would be useful. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, I'd love a refresher. That would be good. Thanks. Okay. So the five Buddha families are the kind of embodiment of the five wisdoms. And the five wisdoms are what we will all be able to embody and use once we're fully enlightened Buddhas. But in the ordinary sense, they are the energetic aspect of elements and times of day and colors in a way like personality types. And there's the energy when it's in its distorted afflicted form. So they're also related to afflictions and aggregates. 
Okay, so, you know, I can give you a chart so you don't have to like rush to write all this down and it's all, you know, available on the Burzen website on study Buddhism. It's also available in Chugyam Trimpa's text, um, Journey Without Goal. So, you know, this is all findable information if you don't get it all tidy. But basically we're looking at, take Chen Rezig. He's got Amitabha at his crown. Okay, so Amitabha at his crown means this is a lotus family practice. See Amitabha there? And all deities are going to have a Buddha either hovering above their crown to indicate Buddha family, although sometimes it's like Lama Tsongkhapa or Shakyamuni Buddha, so that's not always where you find him. Sometimes you'll find him in this crown area. And it'll just be the little nub here representing the head of the Buddha family. Or sometimes they'll actually draw it in, depending on your artist. Okay, so here's Amitabha, who is the head of the Lotus family. And what's he about? He is about discriminating awareness. So using recognition, using the, the aggregate of recognition, we are wanting to expand and develop in such a way that anything that our discriminating awareness turns on is alive and bright like it's illuminated by fire, that we're seeing things clearly. And so Amitabha is related to the fire element and related to taking the energy of attachment and turning it into discriminating awareness. So think about the way attachment is hungry, like fire. It just consumes and consumes and consumes. And that's its neurotic aspect. That's its afflicted aspect is just hunger, hunger, you know, eating all the logs in the wood stove. The enlightened aspect is the light, right? Is the brightness of the flames that can illuminate, that can pierce through darkness. Yeah. So the elemental quality of fire is not good or bad in and of itself, is it? There's a good use of light fire, warmth, there's a bad use of fire, consuming, hunger, etc. So when we're looking at this thing, we're really trying to understand what is Chenrezig practice particularly cultivating? Chenrezig practice is particularly cultivating our ability to take the energy of attachment and transform the energy, not the affliction, but the energy into discriminating awareness. So each of the five Buddha families does that, right? So for Akshobhya of the Vajra family, who is blue, he's transforming the energy of anger into mirror-like wisdom, which reflects clearly and is related to water, for example. So they're, they're each related to an element, they're each related to an affliction, an aggregate, a time of day, et cetera. And charts can be found or sent to you, but when you're looking at how to purify, you know, after you've done the mantra recitation time, you're again tuning back into the energetic quality that you're trying to cultivate in the practice. Yeah. So it's a lot to take in, I realize, and there's a lot of, there's a lot to dig into. You know, we could do a whole class just on the five Buddha families and it'd be very interesting. Um, I, my favorite book on, on the five Buddha families is Journey Without Goal. And it's also my favorite book about tantric empowerments and what the symbolism of everything means that's coming around and bonking you on the head and what you're drinking and what you're taking, what the psychology of all of that is. So Journey Without Goal by um, Chugyam Trimpa Rinpoche is really beautiful that way. Um, it's an advanced text. And so maybe wait till you have an empowerment to read it. But um, a summary of the five Buddha families can be found in his commentary on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, right in the, in the first little section, there's a really good overview of the five Buddha families. So anyway, fun facts, they'll keep coming up. So when you also do an invocation process, you're sort of inviting all of the deities of all five Buddha families to empower you to be Chenrezig, but Amitabha is his principal. So kind of leading the way is Amitabha, because that's the particular energy you're trying to cultivate in this practice. But all of the others are included as well. Yeah. 
so it'll keep coming up, but um, this idea that all Buddhas are equal, but they emphasize different things. They emphasize different things for our sake because we get overwhelmed otherwise. Yeah. Okay. So one more little section and then we'll have a stretch and um, do the practice. So the power of truth, this is to kind of seal the visualization of the offerings, make it, may it be just so, just as we visualized. And then very common after a power of truth is to add a Lamrim prayer. So you're kind of zhuzhing up, for lack of a better word, your bodhicitta and refuge motivation by expanding it to think of all the main points on the path to enlightenment. So it's useful to use foundation of all good qualities or the three principal aspects of the path, both by Lama Tsongkhapa or any other Lam Rim prayer that just helps you touch base with all of the main pieces of the path, you know, death and impermanence, karma, all the things. And um, then you're keeping the, the mentality that Tantra is not different to Sutra. It's an extension of the same energy you've been using in Sutra. It's building on the practices you've learned in Sutra. Don't leave Sutra behind. So then you do this invocation and, you know, you've already done like a mini invocation right at the beginning, you know, the Om Ah Hum light goes out, all the Buddhas come back. But here we are um, doing it again in a more formalized way. And the tune that I used was my attempt at Lama Zopa Rinpoche's tune, which um, is all full of blessings and loveliness, but it's fine to do it in English as well. Basically, it's an invitation because we become receptive when we invite, even though they're already here, we become receptive to their presence and to their blessings. So what are blessings? <laughs> what are blessings, team? It's a word we use a lot, but what does it mean? Is it pixie dust? Is it fairy sprinkles? Yeah. <laughs> Is it a magic wand? Is it being smudged? No. Blessings. Is it being bestowed with an honor? No, Roxy, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was just going to, you know, riff a bit, but I would think that it would be, you know, Dharma, but bestowed in a way that is pragmatic that you can use, I guess. So maybe it is personal, like you were saying earlier about having a personal relationship with a guru. So I would think that a blessing just, you know, as someone who writes poetry, I just think about, um, you know, visions that, that come in or out of me that are really both personal, right? Very personal, but transmissible to other people so that it can become personal to them. So again, I'm just kind of improvising here for what a blessing might be to me. Dharma in a form that I can use. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's going in the right direction very much. Yeah, very much the right direction. Yeah, Joanne, go ahead. Um, I think of it as simply giving a Buddha blessing. Hmm. Similar to when somebody sneezes, you say, bless you. The blessing coming from a higher power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Bit of, bit of protection, bit of support, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, as it turns out, because we're Tibetan Buddhists, we do have a definition, but um, it's useful to riff for a bit. Um, Jane is saying that it conveys spiritual power. Um, and that's, that's certainly part of it. Blessing is your mind transforming. Okay. Your mind transforming. So in a way, like from a psychological perspective, you might say a cognitive shift. Or kind of more colloquially, we might say a shift from head to heart. Yeah, from an intellectual understanding to a true behavior change. From a knowing to a believing. Yeah. And um, it's, it's something that I think we need to understand that it's not passively bestowed because we are a good kid. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, or like sort of magically sprinkled because we're doing the right thing and now we shall be rewarded. Yeah, again, like don't get weird. Yeah, um, it's, it's not a uh, lifting up of your specialness or a acknowledgement of your superiority or, you know, and I know that you probably wouldn't go that direction, but sometimes there's that connotation with that word. I've been blessed, yeah, <laughs> blessed and highly favored, right? Um, it's, it's a tricky word, and I don't know if there's a better word in English, but a blessing from a Buddhist perspective is that which transforms the mind. What transforms the mind? The mind transforms the mind under the influence of powerful conditions. But you're blessing yourself, really, under the influence of strong conditions. Which is why, you know, we can't go around fixing people. It doesn't work. But we can be a powerful condition to empower them to fix themselves, right? You know, we can be a supportive condition for people to feel, you know, access to their own wisdom or to feel safe to come to their own solutions. We can suggest something that they are almost there themselves without us. Right, you know, like advice that works is advice that they were 90% there already and you just help them with that last 10%. Yeah, you can't like drag somebody into wisdom, can you? The Buddhas cannot drag us into enlightenment. It's the same, same concept. They would if they could, right? They would if they could. They would say, oh, you're struggling. You poor darling, you're struggling. Let's just plunk you into enlightenment. You'll feel better. It's not like they're just like punishing us, right? Letting us suffer. If they could pull us out of suffering, they would. But a blessing is your receptivity to them. So by doing these invocation practices and these offering practices, it's like you're becoming more and more and more open to the very powerful condition of the enlightened mind. And that it, then that enlightened mind helps stimulate the awakening of your mind. Yeah, so then when your mind is becoming more and more awakened, you've experienced a blessing. Is it making sense? So it's not a passive experience of being bestowed, yeah, or being fixed or being healed or any of this kind of like imposition energy. It's that you've been flooded with light, but your ignorance has shrouded you in darkness. So it felt like there was no light there. Yeah, and then you peel off a little blanket and you peel off a little blanket and you can see the light that's been radiating the whole time. And maybe because there is light, you can read something that you couldn't read before. Do you know what I mean? So when we're requesting blessings, we're not saying, please bless me because I've been a really good kid and I deserve a reward. You're not doing that. You're saying, I am open to the love you've been flooding me with from beginningless time. Yeah, and may that love empower my love and may it be an infinite ripple effect, for example. Is anybody feeling lost or stuck? Good. Yeah. Blessings make sense. A lot more than they used to. Thank you. Oh, that good. Great. <laughs> good. You're very wonderful with your words. You should write poetry. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> Cannot take credit. It is my. Father was an English major. My teacher is awesome. <laughs> conditions, conditions. So, you know, th this kind of stuff, I think that when you unpack it, you need a good classic Geshe teaching, right? You need a good Geshe teaching. Geshe's have studied and studied and studied and studied. And when you hear the technical definition, you can get lost in a scholarly kind of trap and miss the feeling and the flavor of it. So you have to sit with the, the technical understanding long enough for it to turn into your own language, which doesn't mean that you distorted the Dharma and made it your own in a creepy egocentric way. It's that you've understood the pith of the teaching. So now when it, you explain it, it sounds like you. 
Yeah. And this is where we all want to get to is that if someone said to us, you know, what is bodhicitta? We know that bodhicitta is the mind of enlightenment, the mind with two aspirations to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient things. That's the definition. Okay. So you can't like avoid the definition and explaining it, but when you're explaining it, you also can weave into it what that feels like or what that resonates with or what that conveys in words that make sense to you or the way you explain it to yourself. You know, so it's like you're not leaving the technical definition, you're weaving the technical definition in with your own words and then it really sticks. And that's part of analytical meditation is taking these things that you've heard and reflecting really deeply so that they become yours and they sound like you. Yeah. And so we all can do that and just gently, gently, but it means hearing, you know, like being patient enough to hear the technical stuff, which can be a little dry, you know, to be honest, especially if your translator is only a scholar and not a practitioner, you know, the Geshe might be perfect and amazing, but then the translator is still like working on their stuff. And so they can just be scholarly or they're trying to get their head around the language and it's a hard language. You know, I tried and failed to be a translator many years ago. My hat's off to all translators. But um, to realize that the dryness doesn't mean that it's dry content. You just have to mull it over to feel the flavor. Yeah, so be, pa be patient with the technical stuff because it's important, but don't worry, you can get into the poetry when you sit with it long enough. So we've got then the seven limb prayer, and this is another thing that gets repeated and repeated. This is the longer version. When this practice, sometimes you see an even longer version, but in this practice, this is the longest time you see it. And later you're going to see it referenced. Let's see if I can find a version, the shorty version. Yes, so you see here, this is also the seven limb prayer, but much condensed, and this gets repeated again and again as well. The seven limb prayer is just an amazing battery of merit. So it's a very useful thing to keep coming back to, to continue the mental momentum of the path. So we'll go back to this version. And again, what we're doing is creating the cause for what we want to happen by engaging with it. So you prostrate with your body, speech, and mind, diminishes pride, engages respect, and helps you become receptive. Yeah. And also physical merit, even if it's just your two palms together. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. We create the cause for resources, we create the cause to continue the practice of generosity and we help overcome attachment. Just being, you know, I mean, we just go right through them, right? Tick, 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 tick. Like it's quite a quick practice. You can also give it more time and space, but you know, it's like you just keep coming back to these same old principles and you get more and more proficient with them. Then I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time. And this part always makes me giggle because you say it and it's like, then two seconds later, you're on to the next line. And you're like, how could I possibly declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time in two seconds from one line to the next? That's ridiculous. And what you're doing is you're laying your mind bare. You're, you're creating an atmosphere of honesty for at least yourself and the holy beings that you're gonna promise to see your stuff. Yeah, you're gonna promise to be honest and have self-awareness about your afflictions and the behaviors that they motivate. Yeah, so it's not like you're literally remembering every mistake from beginningless time. You're thinking since beginningless time, there has been anger and ignorance and attachment. And I'm gonna be honest about that because otherwise, how can I purify it? How can I change the behaviors of it? Yeah, so it's a laying bear. Chen Rezig, I know you see me, but now I'm inviting you to see me. <laughs> yeah, my mess and my potential and all the things. And then I rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings, including yourself. Rejoicing is the quickest way to cut jealousy and is one of the quickest ways to accumulate merit. And rejoicing is a practice that Lama Zopa Rinpoche really, really encourages. 
So, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about rejoicing because it's a cringy kind of word, rejoicing. Um, it feels a little too sweet sometimes. It feels like, yay, you know, and you're like, really? Yuck, what? But rejoicing is actually a deep practice of recognizing a virtue to be a virtue, just like confession is recognizing a fault to be a fault. So when you're recognizing virtues or positive states of mind or beneficial constructive actions, when you remember them on purpose, it makes you want to do them again. And when you think of other people doing good things, it inspires you to live by their example. And it's said that if you rejoice in someone else doing a positive action, you get the same merit as the person who actually does it. And you think, wow, how is that? But if you genuinely think, isn't it wonderful that Doctors Without Borders goes all over the world and offers free medical care, especially in war-torn areas, that is a wonderful, amazing service to humanity. You're riding the wave of their merit. You're not taking anything from them. You're just riding the wave of their merit. And it inspires you and it uplifts you. And it also prevents you from being competitive and jealous if someone says, do you know Doctors Without Borders offers free medical care all over the world, even in more torn places? If you're feeling a bit fragile or a bit vulnerable, you might think to say, yeah, well, I offer soup at the soup kitchen on Sundays, you know, and you get kind of weird and defensive and competitive, you know, like they're not the only ones doing good things. I do good things, you know, how we can get a little weird, a little defensive, a little, I don't know, um, embarrassed or our pride gets triggered even about virtue and that's embarrassing but important to acknowledge. The way to prevent that, actively acknowledge and rejoice in people doing good. Yeah. And particularly your teachers because that's the example you really want to live up to and what we really aspire towards. So I think that uh, His Holiness models this in a million different ways, but it's interesting to see how he is with um, very, very academic people who have a high level of education and are pretty sure of themselves and want to tell him what they've learned about neuroscience or quantum physics or something like that, right? And of course, these things are already understood in Buddhism, yes, and have been for thousands of years. When the neuroscientists or the quantum physicists say what they've, quote, discovered about reality, His Holiness doesn't say, do you know Buddhism already knew that? No, he doesn't. He doesn't say that, even though it's true. What he says is, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. They'll say, Your Holiness, do you know that we found that light can do this and matter can do this and that consciousness is this and that reality is that? Did you know we've just discovered it? You know, and His Holiness will just say, that's wonderful. Yeah, he doesn't need to prove that he already knew that <laughs> and that he knew that experientially and deeply and that he is in fact the 14th Dalai Lama and he's known that for quite some time. He doesn't have to prove anything to anyone. He can just celebrate them for connecting with knowledge and being able to spread it to people that his holiness might not be able to reach because they're not receptive to his style of teaching or don't have a karmic connection. Yeah. So rejoicing actually is an incredibly powerful practice because it just takes you out of that competitive nonsense. It just kills your jealousy and gets you into continuously inspired when you see other people succeeding with beneficial work. Yeah. Thoughts? <laughs> Thoughts? Rejoicing. So it's not, you know, yippee, it's, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, Ali. Rejoicing, yeah, rejoicing is, I find it's super helpful, like, like especially when you feel like that you know competitiveness or jealous jealousy like creeping up um it, it's just like it's you can shift it right away by like rec by like oh why don't I practice rejoicing instead it's like I still kind of ha like have to practice this habit more but it's really helpful yeah yeah and you know and it's something that we have to 
make sure that we also marry it with what we are doing well too, to inspire ourselves. Like, you know, today, I don't know, I wanted to do this and I did this instead. And 10 years ago, I would have given in to my old affliction. It's amazing that I've changed. I really rejoice in that. And no one's gonna know that little private triumph except for me and the Buddhas, you know? That little private triumph of, I caught myself before falling down that old rabbit hole of whatever it is, you know? It's worth rejoicing because it keeps the momentum going. Or you think, you know, today I studied this text that I've been avoiding for years because it's really technical and hard. And I actually sat down and I had a good look at it. And I'm really glad that I sat with it and tried and broke the ice, you know? I'm glad that I didn't snap at that person who annoys me. I'm glad that I was kind to that person who was struggling. It's okay to be happy about what you're doing well. In fact, you should, <laughs> right? Especially on the back end of having done a confession about all the things you've done wrong, right? So if you think, here's all the ways I've fallen off my path, now take a minute and think of all the ways you stayed on it or increased it. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise you're gonna be like, oh man, <laughs> and you'll be all deflated. Yeah, so it's not by chance that confession comes first and rejoicing comes second, because you wanna end on an uplifted note. I rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings, including myself, including people who annoy me, including, including, including. Then these two, please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. These two requests, these are to create the cause to have a teacher and to meet their teachings. To have a teacher and meet their teachings. The Buddhas of course want to teach, the teachers want to connect, but we need to create the cause from our side. We need to bridge the gap. We need to make the link. And that's what these two requests are. So please remain until the end of cyclic existence. This is really like a long life prayer for the teachers you already have and an aspiration that you keep meeting them life after life after life until samsara ends. And then not only may I meet you, but may you continue to teach. Please teach, please teach, please teach. So these two are very powerful creating the cause to meet the teachings. And then you dedicate your own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment and those of all others, you're dedicating all merits because all merits are interconnected. No action is ever done alone. So you're sharing in theirs, they're sharing in yours. That mentality is really important, even though karma is individual, even though karma is created and the seed is planted on one mental continuum, it's like there's an acknowledgement that all of, the, all of the causes and conditions came together for you to plant that seed and that you are a cause and a you are a condition for them planting seeds. So it's a bit of a recognition of interdependence plugged right in there into the dedication. Until the great enlightenment, that means when everybody is enlightened. Yeah, so may all of this mental energy go towards the full enlightenment of every single sentient being. So that is the seven limb prayer. Any questions before we have a tea break? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Um, I've always wondered where the merit is stored. How do we know how much merit we have? And who stores it? Yeah, just behind the ears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, on your mental continuum, just like <laughs> all of your other karma. So merit <laughs> is basically good karma. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cream. Yeah. So on your mental mm -hmm. continuum, with mm -hmm. your mental continuum, imbuing Great. your mental continuum. Got it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Seed like that. Yep. With or Thank without you. sound effect. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other um other seven limb prayer thoughts. Good. Yeah. Anything else about that first part of the text? Yeah, and then it, um, it, that whole offering section finishes with the mandala offering and um, 
the mandala offering really is just saying I'm offering the universe requesting blessings or requesting myself to be receptive to the teachings. So I'm offering the whole universe, you're saying, you know, the four continents, the sun and the moon, Mount Meru, all of this kind of like mythological cosmic cosmology. And you, you know, can make your little hand mudra, you know, representing the four continents and Mount Meru in the center. You know, you can do this mudra, you can add your mala to the mudra, you know, you can do the pretty song, but really what you're thinking is, there is nothing more precious than these teachings that prevent my suffering, that bring me to benefiting others. There's nothing more precious than this. So I'm offering everything for this aim. Yeah. And, you know, in the cosmology, which is kind of folk story at this point, the four continents are actually four planets. And Mount Meru is the center of the universe, <laughs> even though the universe doesn't really have a center like that exactly. So it's, it's more kind of folk story and you don't have to think of it literally. You're just thinking all the beautiful things. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's it for now. Let's dedicate and then we'll have a break. Let's see here. Just had it. Where was it? Dedication prayer. Okay. So I think all of the energy we've put into the morning so far go towards these aims. Janchu Samcharim Poshe Make Panam Ke Gyuachi Ke Panyam Pame Pahi Gone Gondu Kawasho Tony Dawarim Poshe Ma ke panam ke yuchi, ke panyam pa me pahi, gone gondu kawashou. Okay.